Since the end of February, there has been war on the Ukraine. A couple million people left their homes, left their country behind. Some of them were able to take their furry friends. But what happens to the animals that are left behind? Or the ones living on the streets or in a shelter? Since the beginning of war, Peter has been on a mission in the Ukraine. In this very episode of the Peter Podcast, me, Gesine Kühne, will find out how difficult it is to orchestrate a mission in a war zone. So keep in mind that we will talk about some heavy subjects such as war and loss. To get an idea how PETA works, what a mission like this in a war zone looks like, the PETA team has decided to illustrate this podcast episode. On the website, you will find the video version of it. The link is in the show notes. And herewith, I welcome you to the PETA podcast. My name is Gesine Kühne. For this special topic, I have a very special guest, Daniel Cox. Hi, Daniel. Please introduce yourself to the listeners. Yes. Hi, Gesine. My name is Daniel Cox, and I'm the team lead of the campaigns team at Peter in Germany. Um, before we start talking about the war on Ukraine and what that means uh, for the animals there, I would like to know if the Ukraine has been a country to watch um, while being an animal activist. It has, actually, yes. it's It's never been... A really ideal place for animals unfortunately. Um, Peter's already been active there for a long long time uh, most notably during the uh, football championship in 2012 um, where there were plans in Ukraine to actually uh, kill all uh, dogs living on the streets and um, we of course opposed this strongly and had um, lots of celebrities supporting us and we ran a campaign Uh, against this happening um as we speak the war is approximately 100 days old um what were you doing when it started how was your work day that day it was a really normal day so normally my alarm clock goes off at 5 32 a.m in the morning um because i've got three kids to get to school and a dog to take care of and everything so um i switched on the radio as i always do and just caught the news and heard that the war had actually started, that Putin had decided to invade Ukraine, to attack Ukraine. And uh, my immediate thought was, what does this mean for all the animals in the country, um, for companion animals, but also for animals um, being unfortunately used in agriculture? What does this mean? How fast did Peter Germany react I imagine it would have been a topic maybe already before because there was something in the air. We, we had the news all the time and it was um, like a ticking time bomb. Nobody wanted the war to start, but pretty much everyone who was a bit uh, into politics was probably quite sure that it will happen, unfortunately. Yes, so we had already braced ourselves for what we thought was going to come. Uh, it came quicker than, than we expected and Obviously, it came quicker than anybody expected, um, but we were already sort of in preparation mode and were luckily able to spring into action very quickly within a couple of days. And you went to the Polish-Ukraine border. Um, how was that? Um, maybe start with your feelings before we go into other details. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so this was actually the first time I've I've ever done this sort of mission in my life. So um, it was really new to me uh, to actually go into a, a war zone to experience um, this firsthand, because obviously I'd only seen it on the news up to then. And it's quite different when you're standing in the queue to cross the border from Poland into Ukraine and you see this endless stream of refugees, of women with small children, uh, with dogs on leads with cats in, in carrying cases and just to see the despair on their faces and and the emotions and and the utter sadness and th this stream of people just goes on 24-7 you can see them at 10 in the morning you can see them in the middle of night 3 a.m it never stops and, and this was really shocking to see firsthand because they also had so little luggage with them they only had a rucksack or a small case and a plastic bag and those were all the belongings that these people were able to save. Yeah, you said you were in line to cross the border from Poland to the Ukraine. That, that means you actually went into the Ukraine. Um, 
going into a war zone, why was it so important to get into the country? Because there were not many organizations uh, bringing animals out of the country. So our first and foremost thought was that we need to go in and get the animals out of the country uh, to save them from danger and also to um, free capacity up in shelters in the Ukraine for f more animals moving in from further east. You, you said to get the animals out of the danger. Well, there we have it. It is dangerous in a war zone. Um, Is that uh, something you discuss with yourself, maybe with your family, that you are entering um, a dangerous zone and, and also risking maybe your life to save animals? Yes, so um, I basically gave my family one hour to decide whether it's okay for me to go or not. And luckily they said, um, go for it. This is important. This has to be done. Someone has to do it. Um, and, and I left within couple of hours notice. I packed my stuff and set off, picked up the Peter car uh, and off we went. Um, Were you scared or is it not being scared? Is it maybe uh, being a bit intimidated um, but alert because you need to do something very important? It's probably a thought that came later. So when we set off, it was more like an adventure sort of feeling uh, we're, we're doing something special and we're saving animals and, and, and we're heading into this country. Nobody knew what to expect. I personally had never been to Ukraine before and uh, was quite surprised by um, yeah, the kind of level of poverty also in the country because if you drive through Poland on the way there, Poland is super well-developed country. Uh, you don't notice any difference to any other countries in the in the EU. Um, but when you cross the border to Ukraine, it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a different world. It's a different world. And um, the first time you see the soldiers with their Kalashnikovs and you see the checkpoints blocking the roads, not letting you pass until they've check what you're actually planning to do in the country. This this is a bit frightening to experience, um, but you can push that aside very easily. Uh, so you just get used to the situation very, very quickly. And um, yes, you kind of just accept the fact if something were to happen, that would just be really bad luck and probably over with very quickly. So you, you try not to think about it too much. <laughs> You mentioned checkpoints, you mentioned soldiers and going into the country. Of course, you have to go across a border. Um, was it easy to get into the country? I mean, you said um, you had to explain why you're going into the Ukraine. Um, I just try to imagine what a soldier might have to say to that. Yeah, so we were easily recognizable as a humanitarian aid convoy. So we had a flashing yellow light on the roof of each of our vehicles. We had signs on the bonnet, on the hood and on the sides of the vehicles and obviously we had visiting cards of Peter so we were able to prove that we actually worked for Peter and um, the negotiations with the border patrols, they were not that tough. So I grew up in Berlin when the wall was still standing um, and so I know what it's like to enter from West Berlin into East Berlin, what that felt like, uh, how much scrutiny was applied when you were checked at the border. So this was nothing new to me um, and didn't frighten me at all. Um, you sent me a couple of pictures and in one you can see um, a lot of animal transport boxes. Where did you get those boxes? So um, Yeah, where did you get them and so quickly actually? Because I don't think that uh, Peter has all those animal boxes flying around just randomly. Yeah, so we always have some boxes actually in our offices um, because There's often stuff that comes up, emergencies that come up um, without any prior notice. And then we always need some boxes there so we can spring into action quickly. But we bought most of them on the way actually to Ukraine. So we had a stop uh, in Berlin because we had to pick up a second vehicle there. And uh, we then just went to all the um, pet shops in, in Berlin and bought as many boxes as we could get into the car. And there's also a very cute picture of you with a cat on your lap in the car. 
who was that little furball and where is the furball now? <laughs> <laughs> so he actually had no name. Um, so we, we called him Dorian because he's grey, so Dorian the grey cat. And um, he came from a shelter in uh, Lviv where we picked him and many other cats up. And um, we were in the car with about 30, 35 cats and um, two of us in the front, um, some refugees in the back of the car, so the car was fully loaded. And then we um, drove from Lviv to the Polish border, which takes about two and a half hours. And then at the border, we had to wait the usual five, six hours uh, until we were allowed to pass. So you stood at the border in the cold and the, the car isn't moving, obviously. And this one cat, Dorian, he started to meow pretty loudly and he was the loudest one of them all. The, the rest of them were really pretty quiet and peaceful. Uh, so we decided to just open his box and take him out because uh, we weren't driving anyway. Uh, and then he had great fun sort of obviously cuddling with us, but also exploring the car. So he was uh, running all along the dashboard with all the lights that, that light up there and found it really exciting. And this really helped us um, also get through the border quickly because when the guards then came to check our passports, we wound the window down, they saw Dorian and they said, oh, you've got an animal to take care of. Just go, just drive. You've got more important stuff to do. <laughs> that's um, that's really nice to hear, actually, that there have been uh, so much empathy for animals. Um Yeah, and where is he now? He's in a, in a shelter in Poland now, or he's actually moved on already because he was okay. he was one of the first animals that we rescued, so he's already arrived in his uh, final home, in his new home. We are animal people. You mentioned your dog. I have uh, two cats. <laughs> um, they're my housemates. They're they're my everything. They're like like my little kids. So I do know what kind of range of emotions they go through, even in one day, just like us humans. Um, what state were those animals in when you came to pick them up? It depends on the on the animal. So the cats I found always to be very easy to handle. They were pretty calm, um, and. Obviously, we left them in their transport boxes and when we loaded them into the car, so that was always a very smooth process, uh, not stressful at all for the animals. Um, the dogs were really harder to handle because they were often in in uh, cages that they had been transported throughout Ukraine in, and we had to then unload them into our own cages and then into our vehicles, uh, which took a long time. And obviously, You have to open the cage, take the animal out, um, and the dog is happy to be out of the cage. So you try and invest some moments to give him a little walk and then put him into the next box again. Um, and also there were boxes with several dogs in when they arrived. So this was quite difficult handling sometimes because they were also... Um, frightened and, and, and loud and um, sometimes they also snapped at each other of course uh, so that was that was a bit um, a bit tough <laughs> yeah I, I mean totally understandable because it's uh, especially for for dogs I think cats have the same thing when it, there's loud noises like bombs and whatsoever it's just just frightens them it's so much on their little nervous system so um, when you get them The animals across the border, you couldn't just go on to, to Germany. You had to leave them in Poland. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. What for? Why did you have to leave them there? Well, um, first of all, we were staying in Poland all the time. So we didn't want to waste time driving back and forwards to Germany all the time. And also uh, there were animals that were ill. So we had to take them to a veterinary clinic in Poland that we worked with. Uh, and the others we had to take to uh, shelters on the Polish side. And then it takes a while also to get all the paperwork ready to uh, get the vaccine nations sorted out uh, to make sure all the animals are chipped etc uh, so this takes a while to prepare the animals to then travel on to Germany or also to other countries in the EU where they can then be adopted and given new homes. You just mentioned one very important word paperwork I assume there's a lot of back office work for activist missions like these um, what needs to be done or needed to be done from here from Germany? 
Well, first of all, you need to keep track of all the animals because until now we've saved about 1,500 animals in total. Uh, so this is already a pretty long Excel list of names and locations because we try and track obviously everything. Where did the animal come from? What is the animal's original name? Um, do we have papers? Uh, what's the chip number? A status of vaccination, etc. So this all needs to be, um, this, all this data needs to be accumulated and entered and uh, taken care of. And then we also need to stick obviously to uh, the EU regulations for animal transports. So the animals need to be registered in the traces system, for example, so they can be transported. Uh, and this is all lots of administrative work that just takes time as well. Yeah, how big is a, a team for this kind of uh, mission to, to secure a smooth mission, actually? How many people are working on it? Depends on how many vehicles you have. So um, we, we usually try and have two people per vehicle uh, so they can take turns driving. Um, and sort of the normal operating size was between four and ten people. Uh, did you have a lot of contact with uh, the main office in Germany, in Stuttgart, because things needed to be regulated? Um, if so, wh what was there to, yeah, to, to take care of? Yes, so one of the main things is obviously to sort out where can the animals go when they are ready to leave the shelters or the clinic in Poland. Um, and because... This process takes time and they can stay a very long time. If they are ill, they might stay rather long in the clinic before they are actually fit enough to travel. Um, and then they need the correct paperwork. So uh, only last week we got the last six cats that were still in Poland from the trip that uh, my team had done out and they are now in Germany, but they had to stay there for so long because one of them had kittens and uh, some of them were ill. And this was basically the last group of cats that was still left. Um, so yes, we are in constant contact with uh, the headquarter in, in Stuttgart in Germany uh, that also help us obviously to find uh, places in shelters throughout Germany that have capacity to take on these animals. Yeah, I have one um, one word noted down here on my script. It's called advancement, apparently for uh, uh, European Union law changes. Um, because if I'm informed correctly, there is a quarantine time that the animals need to go through before they are officially legally allowed into the EU, EU, is that correct? That's correct, yes, yes, yes. So you need to do also a, a blood test, uh, the, the teeter test to find out um, is the vaccination status against rabies correct? And uh, this also takes several weeks. And it can't be done in Ukraine because the only laboratory in Ukraine that is able to run these tests um, was bombed, so uh, you have to wait to conduct these tests until the animals have left Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Did um, the uh, European Union make like an exception now because uh, Ukraine has been under attack for almost 100 days now and, and apparently there is uh, a certain level or yeah, tempo required to get people and animals out of the war zone. Is there something different now from the beginning that you can get uh, the animal quicker into their new homes without all this uh, obstacles, hindrances and, and time? Not really, no. So the rules from the very beginning are still in place. So a person fleeing the country, a Ukrainian person fleeing the country, can bring up to five animals uh, with them. Um, that's fine, that works. Um, but as soon as you are an organization helping to rescue animals, it gets very bureaucratic, very complicated, and there are a lot of rules to follow and to stick to. Okay. Um, is it possible to adopt an animal that you saved along the way or not? So it's not possible to adopt an animal directly from Ukraine because for the reasons that we need a quarantine period, paperwork needs to be okay, etc. Uh, what you can do is go to your local shelter and uh, adopt an animal from there because every animal that you adopt from a shelter frees up space for a new animal coming from somewhere else 
for example, from Ukraine, um, because it's all linked. So within Europe, we all work together as, as, as good as we can. And if a place becomes free in a shelter, for example, in Germany, there is then room for another animal to move from Poland or from Hungary or wherever the animal is at the moment that originally came from Ukraine to then move into this free slot in the German shelter. So you don't actually have to go and look specifically in the shelters for Ukrainian animals. As long as you adopt any animal, you're already creating space and you're already doing something good. And of course, it's never a good idea to buy animals from breeders. You should always adopt animals for reasons that you can always find on the PETA website. There's many reasons. So PETA is an NGO and I guess it's always helpful to donate money um, along the way if, if there's some extra in your piggy bank or something like that. Yes, that's right. So every bit helps and we have pretty high costs for the Ukraine mission. It's not just um, the staff going over the border, rescuing animals. It's also, uh, obviously, we support the shelters that we work with. So if we increase their capacity, if they take on more animals than they had before, their cost is going to go up. They're going to need more food. Uh, and, and we help these uh, shelters, of course. And we also help the clinic. Uh, we, we also pay the clinic that takes care of the animals. Uh, and we also deliver really large amounts of food in, in trucks um, throughout Ukraine that is then distributed into the eastern regions where the food is most needed at the moment. As I said in the beginning, about 100 days of war. Uh, do you have an, an update on all those animals uh, in the shelters in Ukraine? Um, has, I don't know, the situation calmed down a bit or... Do they still need to be rescued? What's what's happening at the moment? Sadly, it's still pretty terrible. So, and that's something you have to come to terms with is that we can't save all of them. It's, there are just too many animals. We can do as much as we can with the capacity we have, um, with the financial resources we have, but we will never be able to save everyone. And that's really hard to come to terms with. Um, The shelters that I'm in contact with, we, they, they contact us at least once a week saying we are so full, we need help, we need more food, um, please transfer money to us. It's There's just so much missing because the entire infrastructure in Ukraine is really destroyed and it's really hard for them to get by. Before we come to close our little um, conversation here, which has been super interesting and, and, and sad and also very, very amazing because you guys do what you do. Um, what's, what's the outlook on the situation? How do you continue your work? Absolutely, yes. I mean, it's hard to plan uh, when there's a war going on because nobody knows how it's going to develop. But we're currently planning uh, until the end of this year where we can say, okay, that's probably pretty certain that we will be needed at least until then. And we will extend this beyond that time frame. but that's the, the planning time frame we have at the moment. So end of December, 2022. And at the moment we've moved our operation from Poland where really the shelters are full. The situation has become more difficult there. Uh, we've moved everything now to the border between Ukraine and Hungary. And we have a shelter on the Ukrainian side that we are now helping very heavily with um, really building work as well, expanding their capacity to take on more animals. Uh, we're giving them financial support as well. And we're doing the same on the Hungarian side. We have five shelters in Hungary that we work with, and um, we are also making them fit to take on more animals um, coming in from Ukraine so that we have a really solid setup there with people that we um, work with now for a long time that we can trust and um, when the animals are then in Hungary ready to leave we can move them on to Germany um, we're in contact with all the shelters in Germany to find space for these animals coming on and uh, so that's the plan that we have at the moment Above that, of course, we're continuing to deliver food all the time uh, into Ukraine. And um, 
provide help where it's needed most. A last personal question. When you say that, you actually sound a bit devastated. How do you, um, yeah, how, how do you get by with this kind of feeling every day? Because either you get really tired and try to shove it away, so you live on with the normal life, or I don't know, you, you get too sad to, to do anything. What's your way? How, how do you just keep up with being happy and helpful? I try and focus on the animals that we've saved and uh, I go back and look at the pictures of the animals that we've saved and we get pictures from people who have adopted animals and it's nice to see them in their new surroundings, in their new loving families. That's something that gives me a lot of strength to carry on. Daniel Cox, thank you so much for your time and uh, your engagement, actually. So happy that people like you and all your colleagues at PETA are around to do the amazing work that, that you do. So um, I think we should acknowledge that as furry friends, people, as I'm saying that, I'm patting one of my cats. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gesine. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Peter Podcast. If you want to get involved, if you want to help, the easiest way is to donate money. So all infos you'll find on the Peter website. My name is Gesine Kühne. Take care of yourself and the animals. Mm -hmm.